Hi guys and welcome to another edition of The Kevin Moore Show, which is sponsored by my website, channeling.com. Now on today's show, I'm about to be joined by my guest, Peter Smith. Now Peter is the author of Quantum Consciousness, Journey Through Other Realms. He is also the creator of the Quantum Consciousness Experience and founder of the Institute for Quantum Consciousness. Now he has trained and accredited a network of conscious facilitators who continue to expand the research base of this remarkable field of work. Now, Peter has always been inspired by his work at the Michael Newton Institute of Life Between Lives Hypnotherapy. He was the president of the Institute from 2009 to 2019, where he was able to take on the role of director of the Newton Legacy, a role created to uphold the philosophy and integrity of Michael Newton's life work. Now, Peter's previous background was as an executive in the Australian banking industry, and the interview that you're about to watch was taped prior to this introduction. So, enjoy my interview with Peter. Nice to be here, Kevin. Um, you know, extreme time difference right now, and I appreciate uh, you coming on. I really do. It's the afternoon, your time. It's late my time uh, in America. And um, were you, I mean, were you born in America, uh, Australia? I was indeed. Yeah, I was yeah. Sydney born and bred uh, in Melbourne at the moment, but, uh, but I've done a lot of travel along the way. Let me ask you, what is the sort of spiritual consciousness kind of community like over there in a sense? Well, Australia is a, a bit of an eclectic mix because, you know, we're the, the bottom end of Asia. We're a, 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 a UK colony and we've um, got a large number of migrants from different parts of the world. So we're a very multicultural society. We're, uh, we're pretty open actually down here to all manner of things. Yes, uh, but but obviously with doing the w okay. Let me ask you this. Actually, what is it that you do? Let's just get straight to the core. Okay. Well, we help people remember that they're more than who they believe themselves to be. We help them to know that they are more than they've been told. You know, so much in uh, for consciousness to use that buzz term. I mean, ultimately, we are a spiritual consciousness walking around in a human body. We are multi-dimensional beings here on a physical plane. We, and once we touch that magnificence, once we find ways in which we can start to feel that we are so much more than this, a lot of uh, things in life simply fall away. Thank you for that. Um, I, I always think it's important just to get straight to you know what it is we're trying to do. And your website is? Uh, Instituteforquantumconsciousness.com. And I've got a personal site, quantumconsciousness.com.au. Excellent. Okay, well, that... Um website is coming up throughout this interview on the screen when you're lower third and your information about yourself you can find out more information on peter in the show more tab just below his books are there and also his website and ways to contact him as well now this is going to be a fascinating interview now this is based on your book a quantum consciousness a journey through other realms why that title you know there's two aspects to that title that come together beautifully in this work kevin First of all, quantum, you know, science has its, um, I guess it has its limitations, the scientific method. And as somebody who's been helping people journey for the last 15 or so years, I've never seen two cases the same. So to be able to reproduce something is um, sort of downgrades the individual and unique consciousness that we are. But having said that, quantum physics is the science of possibilities because they're starting to ask the questions about reality itself. So quantum, for my mind, is uh, something that expresses the inquiring mind of science. Now, consciousness, as you know, uh, as the other part of that, consciousness is who we are when we're out of body. So to bring the two together into quantum consciousness, it's about finding the best of both worlds. Absolutely. So... Um what is quantum uh, uh, physics telling us right now, would you say? Quantum physics is telling us piece by piece that our view of reality is wrong. They're starting conversations about alternate realities. Um, they're looking for the God particle. We're looking for um, different versions of reality, even the, the theory of the multiverse, which goes right back to 1956. I mean, 
Einstein himself called entanglement spooky action at a distance. And if you look at the way quantum physics down at that you know, subatomic level starts to behave, it's not like what we see in this macro physical level. But by the same token, we're made up of those tiny particles. So if they behave differently, then why can't we? Absolutely. Now, obviously, you've got connections um, with lots of different uh, people that you've met on your journey, and you've done so much w on your journey as well. Now, I, I obviously, I know that you, and, and please excuse me if I've got this wrong, but you did run the, the Michael Newton Institute at one point. You were the president of the Newton Institute, is that right? That's right, for 10 years, and I'm still on the board in an emeritus position now. Okay. Now, is that the Newton Institute in America? Well, it's in 40 countries now, but based in America. Right. Okay. So, when you were the president, that was in the States or Australia? Well, I did it from Australia, but you can do so much over, uh, over the internet oh, as we're showing now. Right. Okay. So, what drew you to the Michael Newton Institute? Well, I started to train as a hypnotherapist about 20 years ago. Kevin, and when I saw what we could do as we moved into our subconscious mind, how we held an incredible history of who we are, and not just this, but other lifetimes also, I started to embrace that as a way to find deeper answers to what makes us tick in the here and now. When I discovered Michael Newton's work, and his work is uh, called Life Between Lives Hypnotherapy, and that's where we move in between incarnations to find out how we debrief the last one, set up the next one, all done in a way that is outside of time and space, and giving us a sweeping view across the lineage of our soul. I was just inspired, so I had to go to America to see if this stuff was real or not, and I found out that it sure was. Wow. Okay. So, um, how did you get into hypnotherapy? What drew you into that field? Well, interestingly, I was a client. You know, I, um, I spent some years in corporate life. In fact, I often refer to myself as a reformed banking executive. But, um, but you know, I was in banking for something like 23 years and, you know, I realized fairly soon that I'd climbed the wrong mountain. And uh, running large numbers of people at a young age, I was... I was very much permeated with workplace stress. So I went to my local doctor who was a hypnotherapist. She took me into a relaxed space where I could get away from all the stress. And from that moment, I was hooked. Where did you go when you went into that relaxed space to begin with? Well, in a very simple way for my first experience, she just took me to a beautiful garden. And she took me away from all of my troubles and cares. She dropped me into a place that we created together and left me in that garden to just enjoy the serenity of it all. This was in the back room of her uh, practice as a general practitioner. And she came back for me and she said, OK, it's time to come back now. And I said, what are you waking me up for after 10 minutes? I was having such a good time. She said, you've been here half an hour. So that was, that was my first uh, impression of the time distortion that we get when we move beyond into some of these expanded states of awareness as well. What did you think had happened to you in that, in that moment? I mean, what, did, what was going on in your head in the sense like, well, you know, what is reality in a sense? Well, you know, this is probably 25 or 30 years ago, and, and my approach at that point was pretty simplistic, Kevin. I just thought, thank God that stress is gone. And it's, um, it was really a matter of just getting away from your troubles for a while. I remember going back and I remember sitting outside in the garden in, uh, in our little cottage and looking around and the grass looked greener and the flowers looked different. The sky was more blue. It was like all of the noise had gone. And once you get beyond that noise and you move down through the levels, it's incredible what we can discover. Absolutely, it is. And where did your journey take you from there? I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm guessing as well, you, you must have gone through some sort of self-crisis process where you everything just fell apart, you know, at some point. Well, corporate life was uh, the big thing that needed to fall away from my life. Uh, I think that as you take a spiritual path as well, you make different types of friends. You have less in common with the old crowd. And I think they naturally fall away because half of them probably think you're a little nuts. And, you know, as we, you know, just another piece fell away, another piece fell away. I ended up in America. I uh, got to meet Michael Newton, who wrote the Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls books. That's the Newton Institute, of course. Um, got to know him, worked with him, ran his organization. So every time that I did something and, and stepped more and more into even a, a teaching component of this, uh, everything seemed to make sense, but 
it's like the old trail of breadcrumbs. It's like there's a greater power that leads you to the next thing that you're meant to do. All that we all we have to do is stop and listen and follow the energy. It's like the path lights up in the direction through which we're meant to head. Absolutely, it does. And um, obviously, Michael Newton has passed now. Um, Sixteen, yeah. Yeah, uh, which wasn't that long ago, um, but he left an amazing legacy behind him. And, and his institute, which we'll link below, is still obviously ongoing and will forever be ongoing, hopefully, uh, with its wonderful work. And, you know, you have to be time served, don't you, to uh, approach such a place to, to be trained, I suppose. You can't just go there as a newbie, can you? No, well, that organization itself, uh, we train people who have already been hypnotherapists for a while, uh, who have done past life work, who have some clinical experience, because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people in life hold trauma. And sometimes before you can do that deeper spiritual work, there are some boxes that we need to tick in this life. And, and that's part of our healing before we commence that exploring. So normally we train people who've already been good therapists for a period of time. So it's it's quite advanced work because you know we're working outside of time and space kevin and when we do that anything can happen so you've got to be ready for all those things and have a good foundationary skill set in order to serve the clients that come that's right so uh with your work right now are you um still seeing clients i am yep yes and and they're only in person well i do some uh some work over zoom not so much the life between lives work, which is the four hours work, but with uh, the quantum consciousness, you know, and, and I, I help people with everyday things that are happening. You know, I have an expanded viewpoint, but ultimately if somebody is uh, struggling with anxiety or depression, that's the thing that we need to do. We may have some fairly uh, uh, creative and imaginative ways in which to address it. And sometimes clients are holding something that uh, has a metaphysical source it's great to be able to have some techniques that can come from that angle and set people free from their condition. Well, that's amazing that you're uh, doing that. And, you know, obviously, judging from your internet connection and everything else, um, you know, you, you can do that. It's amazing how technology has, you know, helped with the type of work that you're doing as well. And it will only continue to get better um, as technology, you know, gets smarter as well. Um, what sort of people would come to you or do come to you then, in a sense? Well, it can be anyone. I mean, I work with uh, with children at times, you know, and what I'm finding with the younger people is that they're very energetically sensitive, Kevin. You know, kids at school, um, primary school age, they're picking up energy from their classmates. Uh, they're holding the difficult energies of having a tough teacher. Uh, things aren't well at home with family. They'll carry that as well. So I'm finding that there's a generation of younger kids coming through who are energetically sensitive that need some of those energetic techniques to release. I work with adults uh, at the whole end of the scale, whether it's the anxieties and depression, through to the quantum journeys where we go, go out through different realms of consciousness, um, past lives, which I sort of call parallel lives in the book because, you know, we're pretty much living everything at once. And whilst we're here anchored in linear time, I don't find that that applies when we really move into the expanded states of awareness. It's like we have this different view of reality where, you know... A, Something might be called a past life, but ultimately when you've got somebody being chased through a forest when they've been doing their herbal medicines and the soldiers are after them, they're living it in the now. It's not actually in the 1200s like it might appear in linear time. No, it's not, is it? And we'll get into that very, very shortly. I mean, how has this work changed you as a person? That's a, that's a great question. And... I guess, you know, as a banking executive, you know, we talk about the imposter syndrome and that sort of stuff. You know, I, you know, I was young and, and very senior and always felt like it wasn't where I was meant to be. I guess what I have in, at this time in my life, and I'm 55 now, what I feel is I get out of bed every day and I feel authentic. I feel that I'm here doing what I came here to do. Uh, and I feel not so much a, you know, a satisfaction that comes from helping people, but a sense of fulfillment for helping humanity more generally. Yeah, yeah. And do you find that even with relationships and with others and yourself, 
Is that still a relationship that you're having a better relationship with yourself now and others for for the work that, that you've taken on in, in this lifetime? Look, I, th- I think it is. I, th- I think that we are in touch with so much of the metaphysical realm that's important for us to stay grounded. And I really feel that my soul led me into 23 years of banking so that I could probably remain quite grounded as I deliver spiritual yeah. services. Yeah. Yeah, now that's what I was going to get to. That is exactly where I was going to lead to, groundedness in, in this field. Because do you find that if someone that's coming to you is really ungrounded, that their message coming to them is ungrounded? Or do you think they're getting the message that they need to get? Because, you know, I mean, you come across as very grounded. And there's lots of it, stories in this field that are totally so out there that... But then again... Is that okay to be out there? Because this works out there in the sense when you go out of time <laughs> and out of dimension. Well, I, I think we need to explore the universe, but then we need to circle around and bring it home, Kevin. And, you know, there was a lot of feedback on the New Age movement a while back that, you know, everybody was floaty and out there and uh, lost their grip on reality. I mean, ultimately, we can explore the universe as much as we possibly can. But at the end of the day, what does it practically mean for Pete? What does it mean for Kevin? How do you get value out of this in your life today? How do you get out of bed of a day different in a way that raises your vibration and allows you to live the life that you were meant to live? I mean, those are the grounding questions that we all need to have. You know, I don't have a lot of time for the flaky aspects of the work or anything that really lacks the depth of research and experience behind it. But if you can get the robustness into the spiritual journey and the groundedness into the outcomes of it, it makes for a wonderful life. How do you combine that for your clients then? I mean, that's the difficult part, isn't it? After whatever the session they've gone through, how you've got to be the sort of interpreter for their sort of lower self sometimes as well, haven't you? Yeah, look, you do. And... You know, we can expand a client out as far as they can go out into these expanded states of awareness. And, and often they're looking back. It's If I could liken it to like an out-of-body experience, you know, the, the client's consciousness is out here. That includes the body, of course, because part of their consciousness remains active. But at the end of the day, when they're in this uh, expanded state, say it's you, Kevin, I might say, how will Kevin's life be forever changed? You know, what are the differences Kevin will have in his life as a result of this journey that we're in right now? Um, Observe the future, glimpse the future and tell me what is he doing and how is it different for him? Tell me of the vibration that he's holding. So what we're doing is we're setting this up as a very grounded, self-fulfilling prophecy about you being able to step into a life that is different and carries the benefits of this journey with them. If you go out there and you leave it out there, you come back to how you started. But it's the integration of this work that gives it its true power. Absolutely. So someone being chased in the 12th century, and if that's happening in real time, in a sense that out of time there is no uh, difference, that that lifetime is experienced in in, in a sort of parallel fashion, in a sense, to this timeline, one affects the other, doesn't it? Absolutely. And in the book, I call these like a quantum ripple, if you like, that from all of the expressions of our consciousness in other places and other dimensions, you know, this is the doorway to all of those. So when I tour a client out into these expanded states of awareness and they are touching these other aspects of themselves, they are quantumly entangled with those other expressions of their consciousness. So if I'm running through the forest in fear to get away from the soldiers in the 1200s, there's every chance that I might walk through a forest now and not feel relaxed. But if you've, if you've been chased in six different times into the forest and been persecuted and maybe even executed, then, um, you know, you might have a forest phobia. But by understanding this and, and bringing it into their line of sight and then breaking the energetic linkages across time and space, they're free to roam the forest whenever they like and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that is just one tiny example of the masses of work that you've done in this and, and the healing that you've given to people as well. And again, this isn't everyone's cup of tea, but for those that it resonates with and for those souls that are ready for this particular type of experience and work, then that's right for them. Once the, once the, 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 the student's ready, the teacher will appear. I agree. You know, and, and I think it's important to, you know, not judge people, but to recognize people where they're at in their journeys. 
And if you want to be truly spiritual or, or whatever that may be, then there's every chance that that particular person just needs to pick it up somewhere. And even just to have the experience of knowing that, you know, there is more okay. to this reality than you can even imagine, what's that do to the soul? I mean, that, that, must, that must advance people in ways that they could never have imagined just to touch that space. Uh, look, ultimately, this is about how do you view life differently? How will life be forever changed, as I said before? For you to understand, and, and you know, we all suspect, and we've been told some, since we were young, if you've got any sort of religious background, that you're an immortal soul having a human experience and you go somewhere when you die. For you to experience that firsthand when you are in a lifetime, uh, particularly talking about LBL or other expanded states, for you to know from your own experience that you are an immortal being having a human experience, you do the flip. You're not the human being having an, a spiritual experience now and then. You're fully in spirit and you're looking into uh, who you are now in this expression of your consciousness. For example, I see Pete as one example of uh, my overall soul's journey that is endless and entirely metaphysical. And, and, you know, just to, you know, for others to hear our conversation that need to hear it, maybe that's the freeing thing for them in this moment right now, just to re-remind people that they are more than their body, more than they could imagine. And, you know, whatever issues you're going through right now, um, it's all the journey that you're on. Exactly. And part of the... The beauty of Michael Newton's work in particular was that we set up a lifetime before we arrive and that we plan the, the family, the culture, uh, some of the events in our lives, uh, the contracts that we have with other people who look like our enemies but are in fact our teachers. For us, for us to take that elevated view of the life that we have chosen, it means that there's, there's no way that you can blame anyone else for what's happened in your life because we in fact created it before we came. Yeah, and, and not all of us are ready to hear that, are we? Absolutely not, and there was a time when I wasn't as well, so I have sympathy for all those guys. Uh, you know, if uh, a younger me met an older me, he might think I was, I'd was i gone off the deep end, but I'm sure I could sit down and have a practical conversation with him that might be helpful for him too. Uh, absolutely. Um, so Michael Newton's work, the belief was with all the people that he had regressed, which were there were so many, right? Uh, that 7,000. 7,000, Jesus. And, and that's not even including all the people that he's trained and all the people that have been trained by other people, right? That the life is planned. That anyone that came in our life, it wasn't just coincident. But can we change the plan or does it eventually still go back to what the plan would have been no matter how much you may try to stay, stray away from that plan if, you are, if it is possible to stray away? I really believe, Kevin, in all that I've seen in recent years that free will plays a great role in the construction of the universe. I think there's a creative aspect to us and we see this in quantum physics with the observer effect. I mean, whatever you entangle with in your energy, you affect. So, and, you know, subatomic particles make choices based on our own intention. And without trying to get too lost in the science of the double slit experiment, etc. Ultimately, we are the creators of our own destiny. So if we choose a particular lifetime and we come down to that, then, you know, um, that's for the evolution of our soul. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, and it helps you to put to the side uh, some of the greater distress. And you can do all the, you know, why do I incarnate in that country? Why do I incarnate into a third world country? There's, you know, I mean, chances are it's not really a big deal because we've all done all of it across the lineage of our soul. Right, right, right. And, but sometimes we can make decisions that can still feel like a complete shock to us that we even did that thing. Yeah, to, to, almost like a feeling like, what the fuck have I just done? <laughs> you know, how did this happen? Well, well yes, and the, the question for that is that how does it feel inside? You know, somebody have, some people have said to me over the years things like, you know, I always knew my dad was going to pass early or I always knew that I would meet somebody in Greece. It's like the soul is tuned into the plan that's unfolding even if the human part of us remains ignorant of what's happening metaphysically. 
and I love stories like that because that gives power to intuition. Oh, I mean, you God, you must have heard so many different stories, right? And we'll, we'll try to touch on that just very briefly in this quick interview. Um, yeah, what, what is the purpose of all this? In, with all the work that you've done, put, put Michael's work to the side, with your experience of everything that you've been through so far, why do you think this is happening? Why, why are we even having this conversation, me and you? Why, why is this experience even taking place for all of us? Well, I believe that we're on the verge of an awakening of consciousness on this planet. I think we all know. Yeah. Uh, and I hear it from clients all the time. You know, why did you incarnate here at this time? Well, I'm here to be part of the changes. I'm here to help, you know, and I'll say to them things like, have you helped change consciousness before? And someone will say to me, yeah, I've been through it many times, sometimes on other planets. So they're actually, you know, these are people who are very practical, down-to-earth people. This isn't the people out of La La Land. And they're telling me when they move the human aspect into the background and they speak directly from their greater consciousness, these are the things that I've been hearing for many years. But we're seeing a, a shift of change happening on this planet. We're seeing an awakening of consciousness. There's going to be a lot of the old ways will fall away to be replaced. But that really does take collective free will to accomplish. A lot of people want to stick with the world the same the same way it is now, economically, um, the misbalance between the first and third worlds. A lot of people actually like the arrangement the way it is at the moment. But it's but it's not for the evolution of humanity for us to stay in the old. You know, we need to create something where we cherish every soul on this planet. Everybody is well fed, everybody is healthy, and we have the resources that can go around that take our uh, collective consciousness to a whole new way of being. Now, we have the potential to do that. It's just a matter of getting the momentum behind the changes. Yeah, and do you think we've all got a unique role, those of us that are awake, to, to serve in that, awake, that larger awakening? Absolutely. This conversation is an example. And for anyone who listens, that's part of the ripple effect of our conversation today, Kevin, because that helps people to start to ask themselves the questions. Am I happy with this the way it is? What's my view for the world? What do I want to leave the generation that follows me? At the moment, our legacy isn't too good. No. What, we need to change. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and do, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, that there, there is a shift. I mean, and, and even for the small amount of years that I've been doing this show, I, I've, I've been seeing it. Now, whether it's I've wanted to see something that's not there, I don't think it, it is the case. I've, I've just... There seems to be a shift going on. And, I mean, just look at politics. Everything's crumbling. Yeah. Everything's breaking down in ways that we could never have imagined so, so quickly. And, um, you know, there is a lot of tra change going on. But I, I, I think, do you, was there ever any talk in the work that you've done that we've been through this before, that this is a, a, a we, 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 we've, you know, that perhaps this is a, we made it already and this is just, um, you know, this is, if time's not linear, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It, do people yeah. connect with aspects of themselves where they say, look, look you, you already made it, you're just re-remembering? I think there are different futures that we can head towards and I've heard people describe different futures, anything from utopia to total destruction. So in a quantum universe, all those possibilities are out there. I get people who tell me that they've been part of the changes on Earth before as well. For example, you know, something that, um, you know, I don't want to get into the, the Atlantis sort of phenomenon, but, you know, I have, I, you know, I, because a lot of people want to think, well, I was in Atlantis or whatever that may be. But I've had so many people tell me about ancient civilizations that had um, much better technology than we have now. They had different types of science, but something went wrong and it all came tumbling down. So whether there's a cycle, because the old rise and fall cycle is something that we've witnessed so much through history, even in recorded history as we know it. Well, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, 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 the great thing about the, the Michael Newton work with the, the life between lives, I mean, what a special place to go to. And what, what is unique about that space, do you think, that we can get from that space that we couldn't get from other types of regression? 
Well, I think there's a purity to it that echoes the magnificence of the client within Kevin. I mean, ultimately, there's a part of us that stays in the spiritual realm when um, the rest of our energy incarnates here or in other places as well. So if you look at that, and we, we add just a little bit of science to that, if that's an aspect of our soul that's there, we must be quantumly entangled with that. So why can we not just shift our awareness from this piece of me to that piece of me? And there we are, we're home. Now, I think Michael Newton built a process that allowed this to happen. And we've been using it successfully for 50 years now uh, in 40 countries and in 20 different languages. So these sessions are happening around the clock in different time zones. There's, you know, we love to say at the Institute, there's always somebody in the spiritual realm anywhere in the world at any one time. So, you know, I, I think that he was really onto something, but I've even had clients tell me when they've been in that state of being. Uh, I've um, they've said if there's any questions that you'd like to ask I'd say yeah why is this being made available now and not when we cross over because that's when we normally go back into the spiritual realm and the answers I've had you know on the several occasions that I've answered that have all been very very similar in that it's time for us to awaken and if you can have this spiritual experience while you're still in this life you can do more about it in the now and you can change your life here and now and that ripples out from you and changes the world and do you think that getting a little bit out there with this but do you think as well the if you if you can make the best of this and improve yourself in this moment now in this lifetime that actually that's rippling to future lives and past lives even though they're all happening now absolutely absolutely and you know we are a doorway to so much more i mean this this human doorway that we've chosen uh, is endless. I mean, there's so much behind us when we expand our consciousness beyond what presents here. And, and you and I sitting in our chairs, the human aspects of us are having a conversation, but there's so much more going on in the background that we can't even understand. And, and, and you know, and we're trying to keep this conversation not basic, but there for everyone to that, you know, no matter what level that they're at, that they could get something from this interview. Do you know what I mean? That, that, you know, we're not... Uh, being spiritual snobs about it that you know you, you using language that we don't need to use you know and, and, and putting some some new beginners or people even you know just re-remembering off um not that there's no spiritual snobbery between us but you know i don't i don't i, I have kind of almost walked away from all all, all, all the language sometimes because it really pisses me off you know that that you know it's, it's just I, I truly believe and i don't know if you've come across this but i think we've just barely touched the surface of what this reality is even with all the great people that have been out there and done the work we've barely touched the surface i agree and for the people who want to be really grounded and practical about that there's a, a few aspects that we see in day to day and and firstly i believe that just about everyone on the planet at some level has had a metaphysical physical experience whether they've felt uh, a past relative brush past them or appear at the bottom of their bed. Um, we talk about the Mandela effect, and for people that don't know what that is, uh, there's a whole vast percentage of people in some countries that remember Nelson Mandela passing away in prison. Okay, whereas a lot of people are saying, well, no, that never happened. And then they'll talk to other people, yeah, I remember that. So there's something in the collective consciousness about a bleed through from another reality. We talk also about the Maharishi effect, and these were some experiments done in the United States many years ago when 10,000 people meditating for peace can uh, drastically drop the crime rate in one of the cities. Philadelphia was one of the cities that they did this in, and they actually measured the crime rate after all these people were meditating on, meditating on love and peace. So, you know, we look at the random number generator machines that measure impacts in human consciousness. And they talk about um, a random generator machine is something that works on probabilities. It's like the tossing of a coin. And over 10,000 tosses of a coin, you'd expect 5,000 heads, 5,000 tails. So these run in different parts of the world, continually doing this. When there's a spike in human consciousness, the, um, these things go out of whack. Now, the three times that they've measured it, um, you know, and this data's a little old now, so there's been more recent ones, but one was... Um, the Twin Towers. Uh, one was uh, when Princess Diana was killed. And another one was when the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial came down. But the, the interesting thing about all this, Kevin, was that those um, spikes in consciousness happened before the announcement. 
moments before this actually hits human consciousness. It's like they're bleeding through from a different um, time and space. Right, so when people say they've had these wonderful or amazing experiences, and to them it's so true, I mean, there are the liars out there and there are the fraudsters. Of course there are. There, there are, there are sure. fraudsters in any uh, type of work, right? But for those who, that's, are, that's true. who are genuine they truly believe it because to them it's happened because they're tapping into a parallel part of themselves where to them that was that was a true true experience and this is the beauty of the question uh, how will life be different for you now how are you in a different state of being from what you were before you saw this and whether a past life is a dream state or whether some people might just see it as a metaphor waking dream lucid dream whatever they want to call it um, the question is well how are you different now and somebody says well now I can walk in the forest without getting nervous then the job's done I mean and how they want to integrate it is up to them but at the end of the day they've got a difference in their lives can they learn to forgive those that have done them wrong in this lifetime as well as seeing it from a perspective that maybe they get to see the past life connection with the people that that have you know done them wrong in this lifetime as well previously well, you know, I've seen countless cases of people who signed up for tough jobs to be the perpetrator in somebody's life so that they could understand what it takes to to have pain, to be persecuted, etc. And, you know, can I tell you one little story, Kev? Yeah. You know, we did a, a training in Chicago in 2007 uh, with Michael Newton, last one before he retired. And... Uh, I want to say at the outset that I in no way endorse um, the cruelty of World War II, the Holocaust, etc. In no way endorse any of that. But but when we did a demonstration here in front of um, a class of 30 odd people, and we always do a past life, someone goes through into spirit and experiences a life between lives. The person who volunteered to be the demonstration in front of the class um, went to a past lifetime where she was a nine-year-old Jewish girl in a concentration camp. They went to the gas chambers, uh, she passed, she moved out of her body, and she went back to spirit, and she was debriefing with a spiritual guide. And so this is being facilitated in front of the group, and, and the facilitator, one of our teachers, was saying, tell me about how you feel about that lifetime she says well it was only a short one i knew it would be a short one but i wanted to experience what it was like for a group of people to be persecuted and then leave together or, or some such thing a long time ago i can't remember her exact words but then she well tell me what else is happening there the facilitator says she says well there's another group over there who are having some extended healing oh okay well, who are those people well they're the perpetrators they're the ones that signed up to be able to give us the lessons. Uh, but I wasn't courageous enough to take that job on. Okay, and that was, you know, that... I'm not trying to desensitise, you know, uh, what happened in World War II, but what I'm offering is that when we take a spiritual viewpoint, we see things quite differently. Yeah, now, is that enough to break down the systems in place? Because we need these systems. I was telling you off air that, you know, I'm doing a murder documentary... And, yeah, and yeah. you know, I, I want those systems in place. I, I, I want protection from people that are a, a menace in society. Obviously, I want them to, you know, go through a, a rehabilitation period, you know, if they can do. But, you know, we live in a reality where there, where there is systems in place for a reason. But when we look at yeah. it from a spiritual perspective... What would that do for us? That that would allow us to to forgive and and try to move on. Try for everyone to move on. Well, I I believe the systems have a purpose, and if somebody comes down here to incarnate to become a a, a perpetrator, so they commit murder and they go to jail, like the fellow you spoke of when we were talking before. Um, part of his journey in this lifetime may be to understand how he can learn to forgive himself, how he can then be the ripple effect to other people, other inmates during his period of time in jail. Uh, what is the interaction that he has with every other soul while he's in there? So within the system and knowing that the system is there, he may have incarnated into this situation for many, many, many different reasons and to be part of this infrastructure that's still here now. 
not saying necessarily we should throw the system out and all be, you know, um, love and light and, and throw daisies in the air. But ultimately, we learn a lot by going through what that whole system offers. You know, I spoke to the victim's uh, only remaining family member. Her name is Susan. And she told me, point blank, you know, she can never and will never forgive this man for what he has done. And I felt at that moment, oh, my God, you're hanging on to so much pain for your brother's death that your brother's yeah. moved on and he's okay, but he, he's not able to, to tell you that or you've never been able to hear him in your dreams or whatever, right? And what does it do to a soul to want to experience the holding on to such pain? Does that help them progress or is that an amazing thing to take back to the collective? Well, who's to know? Maybe her journey is to learn how to deal with pain, how to cope with pain, uh, how to transcend pain, you know, and, and ultimately that may be a lesson that's that's still working and, and not knowing this lady, it's, you know, I don't feel terribly uh, comfortable. No, 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 no. It was just a sort of... The, the, what, the what ifs. Yeah, you know, the, yeah, because, ifs, because you, you imagine how many people hold on to... She was just an example to me. I mean, I feel for her, don't get me wrong. I met her. But an example of how many other people were just like her as well or, or, or you know, could be a him. And, yeah. and I'm like, wow. Yeah. But then I think to myself, would I be able to forgive? And I, and I, I, I think I would be. I think I would want to. But... None of these lessons are easy, are they, for any soul? I mean, you know, we're seeing it from the soul's perspective when that little girl was going, you know, ascended back and was de being debriefed. But when she was living it, it was real. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is free will, Kevin. You know, uh, how we choose to run our emotions and our energetic fields and the experiences that we draw to ourselves and how we process them. That's what makes the universe tick. Well, what do you think this message of what we're talking about now and the sort of big, the general message or the bigger message of the work that you're doing, how, how do you think that can affect other people to hear this? Do you think it really helps them to see, well, you know, yes, I've got this life right now. Shall I make the most of it? Or could some people think, well, I've got this life, but then I've got all these other lives I could live. So, you know, bollocks to this life. I don't really get, I'll, I'll give up on it a little bit. We're not trying to say that, are we? We're trying to say this life is the most important one right now that you're focused on, even though there may have been previous and there will be future, possibly for most of us, right? And I'm sure you've got the free world not to have to come back, but you probably are desperate to want to come back as much as you were to leave, right? Um, that, you know, make the most of this one. Yeah. Look, I think the, the foundationary piece in all of this work is that people are far more magnificent than they could ever possibly imagine. Now, once you start to experience that and you experience more of the greater skills that you have, more of the, you know, the potentials that are yet untapped within you, that helps you to cope with life better. Like for somebody who's, you know, scared of doing public speaking, for them to understand that they were not were an orator, a town crier, whatever, in the Middle Ages, um, and to experience that as some sort of a past life recall, parallel life dimension, whatever it is, and to feel what it's like to stand in that person's shoes and to speak in front of hundreds of people, I mean, what does that do for the public speaking skills in this life? It's got to help. Have you come – absolutely, just thank you for that example. Have you come across those that have said that they're able to communicate with – parallel versions of themselves and other realities that are experiencing the same lifetime this time but in a, in a in a different version yes and are they able to sometimes know that because they're speaking to themselves in that other reality to see what they could be doing more in this reality or vice versa well interestingly i've got a personal example of that and and when we first started to form this field of work we were the first crash test dummies and I remember being at the age of 50 and meeting my 60-year-old and he, he advising me. And, and this all happens in a, an expanded state. It's not like he's sitting here on my knee or anything. But, but, you know, you can connect the awareness and the consciousness across time and space that way because we're entangled. And um, I was trying to work with a decision of whether to go into this new work, to still run the hypnotherapy school that I'd had for a while. I was still running the Newton Institute. It was just too much. And he came through very practically and he said, let go of that one because that's not where your future lies. Your future lies in these other things. So get on with that. 
and that's where the quantum consciousness work really picked up speed because I left some of my other work in the hands of some other people. So um, that's the practical part of it. And That's an incredible story. <laughs> yeah, once, you, yeah. once you've opened a few of these doors, I mean, these expansions of your consciousness stay with you. So, yeah, wow. And, and that's open, that experience is open to anyone that has a session with you as long as they're uh, open to it. Do you find that you've ever had clients that were not able to go under at all? Look, that's, I guess after many years' experience, that's something that I pick up fairly quickly these days when we first start off in our conversation. And I'll ask about where are you at, tell me about life, tell me about your early days. A lot of people carry some fairly intricate defense mechanisms, um, you know, some subconscious blockages, if you like, that just are designed to keep them safe. But when you don't see them as a block, when you acknowledge them as a safety system, and you help that person feel safe and unpack that safety system and surrender that, then, you know, you can usually head off on the journey. But, you know, it might take a session or two just to clear the backlog of some of those things that have been holding them back. But ultimately, even anxiety itself, I don't really see it as a mental illness. I see it as merely a safety system. You know, we're highly activated in the fight and flight response. And so we respond appropriately to the environment around us. And sometimes we do that with a little bit more gusto than we need to, which is where anxiety really kicks in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And do you think that um, people with mental health illness have chosen to sort of have that experience or do you think it was not planned in some, some respects? Well, the first thing, you know, with the question, thank you for that question. And, and the first thing that, that comes to me when you ask a question like that is, who decides someone has a mental illness? You know, I had a lady who, uh, who brought a daughter to me. It was a, a young girl who, um, you know, she had her on antipsychotics, which is pretty powerful uh, medications for an eight-year-old. And this was because she saw dead people. So she was supposedly hallucinating. So I had to sit down with mum and have a chat. And I say, well, she's not psychotic, she's psychic. And because, you know, we confirmed that the relative sh she was seeing, she could actually validate certain details that showed that she was doing more mediumship than mental illness. Wow. So That's, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so the, the mental illness thing for my mind is, is often more subjective than objective. But having said that, some people don't have a great grip on reality and they do need that type of treatment. When, when we do this more expanded type work, though, it usually contraindicates with some of the more serious mental illnesses. Uh, somebody who's already schizophrenic, and that's usually a, you know, that would be a, a, a break in the psyche, usually from trauma, where they've found safe pockets in which they can reside. Ultimately, uh, we may not take somebody like that into one of these sessions because it just may not be in the client's best interest. Well, yeah, and, and for the soul as well. Maybe the soul wouldn't even want to yeah. have that. You know, it, it, it wants to uh, to stay where it is uh, through, through the free will. Um, medical issues. Do people come to you with medical issues? Yep. Often there can be even a physical injury that is uh, has triggered a quantum um, a quantum echo. And, and Michael Newton tells a famous old story from the 1960s where um, a fellow came with psychosomatic pain in his shoulder. And, um, he, you know, as we often do, we associate with the pain, go to the source. And this guy's being bayoneted in the bottom of a trench on the Somme in World War One. So this guy's writhing in pain and, and Michael's asking him all sorts of questions about uh, what his battalion uh, he was in and the insignia on his uniform and who his commanding officer was. And because um, he was always the researcher. Um, he chose to desensitize the guy's pain as well <laughs> to, to set him free from the, from the pain. But after that, he wrote to the war office in London and confirmed all the guy's details. And uh, he walked out without, a, without the shoulder pain and Michael got the research he needed. Jesus Christ, that, that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that, Peter. And, and, you know, some of the people that I've spoken to recently in my journey, you know, talk about that, uh, you know, what we call the spirit world or the, the, the reality where we, where we, where we are. Or, <laughs> I'm using words here and not, you know, not wanting to push them too far sometimes because sure. I realize that these words maybe don't mean nothing because the way we're describing the reality of where we go to is nothing like it is. Yeah. You know, we're just, you, you know, but if we, if we do go somewhere, which I do believe we go somewhere, 
and even the somewhere isn't the right word for it, right? Some are saying now that actually that, that parallel or other dimensions, they are right here. They're right here. Right? Heaven is on earth. It's not, you know, up there or down here. It's actually we're sharing this earth with many different realities. I agree. And, you know, when I started to do the alternate reality work to meet other versions of ourselves and having done what was regarded as past life work for many years, I found that they were even more easy to access because they seem to be closer in, um, they're r running parallel in the same time, just in a different space. Whereas if you try and do something that's outside of linear time, back in the 13 or 1400s, you're moving outside of time and space. And if you look at, you know, you as, in, as Kevin, other versions of Kevin, you are more heavily quantumly entangled with because you've come from the same subatomic particles before a decision split your timeline and went in two different directions. Somebody once said to me, Pete, how did you know that you could access alternate realities? And my answer to that was, well, it never occurred to me that you couldn't. <laughs> so, right. so that's my, that's my yeah. observer effect right there. I love it. That, that, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. And because you're open to that, then uh, it breaks you into new ways of understanding that maybe you're obviously ready for and other people on the journey are ready for as well. Um I mean, obviously, we're, we're kind of getting to the end of the interview here as well, and it's so fascinating what you're talking about. And I know that we've missed out quite a bit um, that we probably didn't include in this interview. But I'm going to go back and ask you, what is the most important message of your work? You're more than you believe yourself to be. Explore. Go looking for the other aspects of you that carry wisdom, that helps you in this life, you know, see yourself as that multidimensional being here in human form, because that's who you are, just discover your truth. Now, again, how can people get in contact with yourself? Uh, a couple of websites, the organisation that I founded is instituteforquantumconsciousness.com. Uh, my personal site is quantumconsciousness.com.au for Australia. Um, but ultimately, there are people all over the world. We have a listing of practitioners. Uh, we have somebody in Mexico, London, a few in the USA, somebody in Canada, across Australia, of course. Um, I do some Zoom sessions. Other people may do that as well. Uh, for the Newton Institute work, uh, we're beautifully spread around the world, 40 countries, 20 different languages, right across Europe. Um, half our people are in the States. Uh, we're in most geographies. Wonderful. Okay, well, those links are down below and they've been coming up on the screen as well. And I just want to say, Peter Smith, just thank you so, so much for sharing this wonderful information with us. And I do hope one day our paths cross again. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin.